Finding a group of people who share maybe a common interest, whether that be language learning or other things, um, they find that community within Language House. And if they don't make community, then their language doesn't improve. Mm -hmm. And like when they connect the people in their section, or even like if they don't connect really on a personal, like they never hang out with them after. Yeah. Like as long as they have that, like that's what I've noticed is like Mm -hmm. the the more community that someone makes, the better their language improves. Yeah, absolutely. You're listening to Speaking of Language a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. I'm Dan Gable, Technology Manager for the LRC. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week, on Speaking of Language, Angelica Kramer speaks with Darren Borders, the Residence Hall Director of Cornell's Language House. They explore the history of the Language House and some of the current events and activities that allow residents and guests to immerse themselves in their language learning experience. Welcome to a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. Today, we are continuing our conversation about immersive language environments on campus. Darren Borders is with me in the studio. He is the residence hall director of Cornell's Language House. Welcome, Darren. Hello. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We are excited to have you join us today. So, Language House on campus. Can you tell us a little bit more about what is Language House and what is the history of Language House? Right. So, the Language House is in a language immersion living learning community, Mm -hmm. which is located on Cornell University's West Campus, um, which is different from North Campus, where the first years live. So um, Language House is open to sophomores through seniors, Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of the Alice Cook House system. Um, So there are five houses on West Campus, and Alice Cook House is one of them. So we're located in Bolt Hall on West Campus. Um, We have about 56 students currently. Um, including our resident language fellows Mm -hmm. who are heritage and native speakers of the five languages that we currently have in the house, which is Arabic, French, German, Japanese, and Spanish. Okay. Um, The language house started in around 1984, and it's been located in different places like Comstock Hall, which is on North Campus, Low Rise 9, Sage Hall. Um, It's had about 10 directors. Oh, well. um, And we have... Probably a good over 500, maybe over 800 alumni from the house. Um, The original languages were uh, French, German, and Spanish. Sure. And over the years, um, languages have come in and out of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, They've increased to five languages. Um, My first year, which was two years ago, um, there were six languages. um, Just because of funding at that time was good, but Mm -hmm. um, usually it's just five languages. But um, Farsi, Korean, Italian, Russian, Portuguese, Mandarin have also all been part of the language house as well. That's a nice variety. Yeah. That's a cool resource for students. So what's what's the process? How does a student get um, admitted to the language house? Right, yeah. So um, students um, who are first years and up Mm -hmm. um, are able to apply to live in the language house starting usually in um, October 1st Mm -hmm. in the fall um, of the year before they would live in the house. So Mm -hmm. applications here in Ithaca, we start housing really early. And so the application will come out October 1st, uh, 2018. And they apply and we have a early decision deadline of November 20th. Okay. Um, And then um, the final deadline is February 1st and they would choose their rooms if they were accepted Mm -hmm. into February. So the way that you are qualified to live in the language house is you have to show that you have taken at least the second uh, course. So it's different in each um, in each department. So it's like usually like a 12, 10, 12, 20s, okay. you know, or it just depends on which department it is. Um, and if people are interested in seeing that, they can go to our website, which is um, the, the easy link is bit.ly. So bit dot ly slash cu language house and okay. uh, we have the information of which courses they have to have taken uh-huh. and how they do that is either they take it and they have to have completed and passed the course before uh-huh. applying or they have to prove that they're going to be taking it right I see. um or they can test out of it right so mm-hmm. they can um which you could probably tell a little bit more information about how people <laughs> can test out of their languages yeah, yeah, right yeah 
So once a student is a member of the language house, what does what does a day look like? What do right. what do the students do? Is it is it totally immersive? Do you have like a no English policy? How do, how does that work? Yeah. So once you are admitted to the language house, you are then put with within a section. So you usually apply for one of the language sections. Sure. The way we decide which language sections are going to be part of the house is by the November 20th um, priority deadline, mm -hmm. whichever languages have the most viable um, candidates, mm -hmm. those are the languages we will move forward with. Got it. And we will, you know, let the others, sorry, those languages are just not sure. going to be there. Uh, but then um, basically you are part of a section that's between 10 to 13 people. Mm -hmm. So the way the house is made up and the doubles and singles, it's impossible to make sure that everyone lives in the same area. Sure. So people are pretty much spread out all throughout Bolt Hall. Maybe huh. they room with somebody who isn't in their language, but maybe not, right? Okay. And it's up to people. They can choose their own roommates. And we like to give people the choice of rooms. And usually it doesn't work out of people wanting the room and mm -hmm, being mm -hmm. neighbors with someone yeah. in their section. Um, but they interact with their sections a lot. So they have four mandatory meals that they have to eat together a week, okay. which is done all in the language. Mm -hmm. and, and then one conversation hour a week, which is also done in the language. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, we encourage people to use the language with each other in the house in every interaction. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you might get a mix of sections in the, the lounge or the kitchen. Mm, yeah. And so English then becomes the default language uh, just because. But, yeah, you know, you do uh, have people who will be having conversations with Japanese here and uh -huh. then someone German over here. So, uh. yeah, I mean, we try to push the immersion as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, we really try to hold the students accountable for their own mm -hmm. development. So holding their section members accountable and holding yeah. themselves accountable. And it's really up to them. What do they want to get out of it? Right. Sure. You can only... Encourage so much, yeah. but you can't force people. No. Yeah. In terms of benefits of Language House, why are some of the, the residents interested? What do they gain from it? What What's some of the positive things that come out of um, living in the Language House? I think that um, for students who are living in the Language House, the Language House is a small community within this large university. So yeah. there's a the university's large. Sometimes people's colleges, like a lot of people from Cal's, it's very large. And so finding a group of people who share maybe a common interest, whether that be language learning or other things, um, they find that community with the language house. And when I ask people um, why they return to the language house, mm -hmm. that is usually the answer. So okay. that they enjoy the the community they've met um, or made, uh, the people they've met, and um, they just enjoy the experience. And because, I mean... Bolt Hall isn't anything extravagant, but like <laughs> really, the language house isn't a building. It technically is the people that make it um, make it up. And um, yeah, I would say that, that the students really just love the community that they've created. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, great. So, exactly, what is your role as the um, director of the language house? Yeah, so my role is to try to foster an engaging community, and I do that through supervising five um, resident um, resident language fellows, mm -hmm. and each of these fellows are um, a native speaker or a heritage speaker of one of the languages. Mm -hmm. For example, the current um, Spanish resident language fellow, um, Stephanie Fuchs is um, actually a heritage speaker of Spanish and French. Her father's French and her mom's oh, wow. Spanish, cool. but she's over the Spanish section. She grew up in Geneva, mm -hmm. New York. So, um, and then the Arabic um, resident language fellow, we, we shortened it for, to RLF. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Arabic RLF, she is from Egypt, and so she's a native speaker mm -hmm. of Arabic. Mm -hmm. And so I um, oversee them by, you know, meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, bi-weekly. We have um, bi-weekly meetings. And helping support them in um, creating a community of engagement within their language section. So um, thinking about like maybe who are some of the weaker um, speakers who yeah. might need a little support and um, where to sit during dinner and who to maybe pair them up with at dinner. And just paying attention to these things so that we're making sure that the students who are in the language house are getting catered support for yeah. for their language goals right the way that the I, that i have seen over the past two years how it works is the more comfortable people feel and the more community and belonging they feel yeah. the better their language sure um, sure yeah. um 
they're better their language skills become, yeah. right? So you might have people who at the beginning of the year are shy, timid, they're maybe embarrassed about their language level, they don't really speak a lot, but by the end, even if they're still not speaking a ton, you know, you you notice that their vocabulary has increased, you notice mm-hmm. that um, they're more comfortable and more fluent. So you do see a measure of like success yeah. um, and growth in all the students who do participate. That's and so great. my goal, my, my role is to help support that yeah. and to help support like um, what we call student and student affairs, student development. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the other stuff that's not language, so yeah. like personal and social and sure. financial and health, you know, yeah. the students, if they don't make community, then their language mm-hmm. doesn't improve. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like when they connect the people in their section, or even like if they don't connect really on a, personal like they never hang out with them after yeah like as long sure. as they have that like that's sure. what i've noticed is like if you were ever to like study this or something you know like if yeah. anyone were ever to come like that would be my like the question i would tell people to yeah. have hypotheses about. that's my hypothesis is that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the more community that someone makes the better their language yeah, improves. absolutely you know and that's we 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 want to be a space like that too Right. right, a social space where people can right. come and they can be comfortable and they can hang out and yeah. have fun and talk to each other, utilize their language. Right. So, so how did how did you end up in your position and what's your background with language learning? Yeah, so it's very interesting. Um, so I've been obsessed with languages since high school. <laughs> um, I started learning German in junior high with by a friend giving me notes from her German class. Session. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, in high school, took French mainly. We only had French and Spanish at my school, so I took French. And then I took German through what was called distance learning at the time, mm-hmm. um, which was on TV at a different school. And then I also took Latin that way as well. Um, and then I thought, you know, I'm just going to become a French teacher. That's what I had dreamed to do. Yeah. I applied to become a Rotary um, exchange student and for a year in Belgium. And I went abroad in Belgium, mm-hmm. lived in the South with two um, French-speaking families and one Flemish-speaking family. It was actually a bilingual family. Like okay. the dad was Flemish and the mom was actually French-French. Um, and so um, learned a little bit of Flemish. Um And then came back, went to The Ohio State University. Um, I was originally just majoring in French. Uh, I was going to take a philosophy course, looked up the professor on Rate My Professor, saw how horrible (laughs) it was going to be, and took an introductory course to linguistics, which changed my life. So um, studied linguistics, fell in love with sociolinguistics, Mm -hmm. um, fell in love with like language documentation. Um, After graduating from The Ohio State University with a, actually I have dual bachelor's, in French and linguistics. Um, mm. I went and taught Fran- uh, English in France and Spain um, for two years consecutively and then um, went off to the University of Utah to get a master's in linguistics. Mm-hmm. I originally wanted to work with um, Dr. Lyle Campbell, who does a lot of language documentation, yeah. but he got a better opportunity this summer before I, <laughs> I arrived in at the University of Hawaii. So um, I ended up going back to sociolinguistics. Mm-hmm. Um, while I was there, I worked a lot with language documentation. I worked on the Shoshone language project, but um, my, my research was mostly sociolinguistics, which is basically the, the, you know, studying language and society. And Mm -hmm. my master's thesis looked at um, the perceived gay sounding speech of returned Mormon missionaries. Oh, wow. um, Based on their gender um, socialization growing up. So whether they conformed to, what society deemed as yeah. um, society, normal societal or gender roles uh-huh. or not, and whether that correlated to people judging them as sounding gay or straight. Yeah. So that was my interest in research, huh. but I also was really um, connected to the Shoshone communities. Um, um, they're the Western Shoshone in Eastern Nevada and built a lot of relationships with them, very close relationships, and then realized that, you know, uh, without the support and education, a lot of these students weren't going to be able to help um, revitalize their language, mm-hmm. right? Because um, Native American students are have the um, lowest graduation rate in high school. Yeah. And so um, basically, in, when I was at Ohio State, I was an RA. So I had been part of what we call student affairs mm-hmm. and um, started looking back into like that realm. Like, how could I do more of student support things? And so I ended up applying to um, master's in college student personnel Mm -hmm. and got into one of the better programs, which is um, at Bowling Green State University. So I've completed my master's at um, University of Utah in linguistics and then 
went to Bowling Green State University and graduated in 2016 with my master's in college student personnel. Okay. So when this job came available, uh-huh. it like really was marrying both yeah. of my backgrounds, yeah. both of my master's degrees. And I was like, this is perfect. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I literally was like, 13 days from application to accepting the position. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was literally made, the job was literally made for me. Yeah. That <laughs> and is I fantastic. love it. I love it. Wonderful. Yeah. This is great. Well, so far, all the things that I've heard about the Language House um, are, are great. As a matter of fact, we just had the um, French section event that we held here at the LRC with. Um, paint without a twist. I guess that's a copyrighted term. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, paint and sip, I think. Is yeah. Like, paint and sip without al- alcohol. Yes. So it's always it's always great to see um, your language house residents um, in, in our space here. Can you remind us again the conversation hours that uh, you guys offer through the language house? Where are they? They're open to the public, right? Yes, yes. So we have... Um, so each language um, has a conversation hour, and you can find those um, conversation hours on our events page on our website. Because um, off the top of my head, I do not. Oh, know sure, where they of course. Are. Yeah. But um, you can find them on uh, Bitly. So b i t dot l y slash c u language house, and that will take you to our website. And on the left, just click events, and we have a Google Calendar with um, all the conversations. And I think there's also links to the um, the flyers where you can mm-hmm, also click mm-hmm. to see each language's meal times and conversation hours. And if you have a Cornell meal plan, you're very welcome to join the section um, mm-hmm. for meals as well. Most of the conversation hours do happen at Bolt Hall, which is located on uh, University Avenue on West Campus. And make sure to reach out to the resident language fellow, the RLF of the section that you're interested in going to so that they know you're coming Mm -hmm. and we can let you in the building. Mm -hmm. Um, You can find their information when you click on the people link on the left side of our website. Okay. And of course, we also have additional conversation hours uh, that are offered through the LRC. All of those are listed on our website. Darren, thank you so much for joining me today. This is um, so interesting and fascinating to learning more about your background and about all the wonderful things that are going on at the language house thank you next week i will speak with celeste kinginger about language learning during study abroad dr kinginger is professor of applied linguistics at the pennsylvania state university she will be on campus as part of our monthly lrc speaker series all of our speaker series events are live streamed so please check out our website at lrc.cornell.edu for upcoming events You can also join us for Celeste's talk, which is titled Language Learning in Intercultural Encounters Abroad on Friday, September 28th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, either in person here in Stimson Hall or online via Zoom. And of course, you can listen to next week's episode online as well. Until then, auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or look for Cornell LRC on Facebook and Twitter. Speaking of Language is produced by Sam Lupowitz and Dan Gable. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, The ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners and do stay tuned for our next episode.